and peace to you from our Lord Jesus Christ. Sometimes humans are having a busy morning, but God is always present. Welcome to this time of worship.
Every Sunday, we're invited to pray a prayer of confession. And it's really the reminder that we just sang about, that we need to get to the heart of who we are and the things that we've done. And so one way that we do that is we confess our sins before God and one another and we bear our soul. Now some people might say, well, God already knows all this, so why are we doing it? Friends, we're, we're doing it for ourselves. When we confess, it changes us. And so let us now pray the prayer of confession that is printed in your bulletin. Merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart and mind and strength. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. In your mercy, forgive what we have been, help us amend what we are, and direct what we shall be, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Through Christ our Lord, amen. How is everyone today? Good. So great to see you guys. If you don't know me, my name is Jason. I'm an elder at the church. When I was growing up, I thought elder meant really, really old people. <laughs> and I found out that I'm old. <laughs> I am. Has anybody heard of a game called Simon Says? Yes. Have you guys played that game before? You want to play real quick? All right, stand up. Okay. Ready? Simon says, put your hands on your head. You guys can play too. <laughs> You're not getting out of this. <laughs> Simon says, put your hands on your knees. Simon says, put your hands on your shoulders. Cover your eyes. So what happens if you don't hear Simon says? Simon didn't say. Simon didn't say. And you're out, right? You're yeah, you're not supposed to do it. OK, have a seat. So what you had, what, in, in other words, you had to listen to the leader carefully, right? You had to listen to the leader carefully in order to win. So if we listen carefully to a good leader, are they going to help us succeed and do well? right, just like the eagles. That's exactly right. The lesson that I want you to take away is that we have to choose good leaders in our lives. Do you think that we can follow God when he asks us? Okay, can we be nice to others? Can we sit with people at lunch that might not have somebody to sit with? Good. Can we play with people that may not have a friend? We could be friends with people. Jesus was the greatest leader. Did you know that? But in Simon Says, if we don't follow the leader, what happens? You lose. But with Jesus, we always win when we follow him. Right? Can you guys pray with me? Let's pray. Dear Jesus, you have called us to follow you. Please give us the courage and strength to say, yes, Lord, I'll follow you wherever you may go. Amen. Okay. And even though not all of us won, you guys still get a prize.
Come on over. You have to ask mom and dad, though, okay? You guys can go to discovery time. Good job. I right. wasn't sure she just stole my sermon. Four <laughs> <laughs> minutes. Yay, you can go right out to discovery time. And they'll be back for the baptism. And I promise to save Miss Storka Cherry. Announcements for today are printed in your bulletin. Uh, looking ahead to January 28th, we have the soup, salad, and bingo. Details are provided. And then on Saturday, February 11th, we have family brunch. And the details are also provided in your bulletin. I would like to now invite Melissa McVoy to share from the deacons. Um, so my name is Melissa, and I'm one of the deacons here at Sipley, and we found out recently through Presbytery that there are asylum seekers coming up to Philadelphia from the south, and they're literally coming with the clothes on their back, which, if you've been in the south, you know it is not the same as the weather here right now. So the deacons have decided that we are hosting, we're running, a coat drive. Um, there are other items that we are also accepting, so if there's something you have that's warm weather related and you want to check with a deacon if it would be okay, we'll take those as well probably. But if you have any extra coats in your closet, if you could bring them in, we have bins in the back. We'll be taking them until February 12th. And then through Presbytery, we'll, get, we'll be getting those coats into the city, into the people that need them. So thank you.
Thank you, choir, for that anthem. I've heard it said that when you sing, you pray twice. Our first scripture reading this morning is from Psalm 27, selected verses. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? One thing I ask from the Lord, this only do I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze on the beauty of the Lord and to seek him in his temple. For in the day of trouble, he will keep me safe in his dwelling. He will hide me in the shelter of his sacred tent and set me high upon a rock. Then my head will be exalted above the enemies who surround me. At his sacred tent, I will sacrifice with shouts of joy. I will sing and make music to the Lord. Hear my voice when I call, Lord. Be merciful to me and answer me. My heart says of you, seek his face. Your face, Lord, I will seek. Do not hide your face from me. Do not turn your servant away in anger. You have been my helper. Do not reject me or forsake me, God my Savior. And now the Gospel reading. Continuing along for a few Sundays in a row in the Gospel of Matthew. We're at the beginning still. This is Matthew chapter 4. And it begins with verse 12. It's the call. You've heard this a thousand times. It's the call of the disciples, those initial disciples. So when Jesus had heard that John, referring to John the Baptist, had been put in prison, Jesus withdrew to Galilee. Leaving Nazareth, he went and lived in Capernaum, which was by the lake in the area of Zebulun and Naphtali to fulfill what was said through the prophet Isaiah. And this, now this quotes the prophet Isaiah. Land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, the way of the sea beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles. The people living in darkness have seen a great light on those living in the land of the shadow of death. A light has dawned. And so from that time on, Jesus began to preach. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. And as Jesus was walking beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, called Peter, and his brother, Andrew. They were casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen, Come follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. And at once they left their nets and followed him. Going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John. They were in a boat with their father, Zebedee, preparing their nets. Jesus called them, and immediately they left the boat and their father and followed Jesus. Jesus went through Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom, and healing every disease and sickness among the people. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Would you pray with me, please? Holy One, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be pleasing to you. O oh Lord, you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. I just want to say 
that Matilda is a most welcome guest this morning. I have a microphone and she doesn't, so I'm at peace. You do what's best for Matilda, but I'm okay. It's nap time for Matilda. So you've heard the story, right? They, they come follow me and they drop their nets. It's an amazing story. I think we've heard it so many times that we don't even, it doesn't even register for us how radical it was that the fishermen dropped their nets to follow tell you a story. Once upon a time, the one who knows me better than I know myself placed an eight-year-old boy named Douglas in my life. I was 23 years old. I had been married two weeks and immersed in my first year as a classroom teacher at a school in a low-income neighborhood in New York City. Oh, I was ready. I was ready for the challenge of teaching 32 second graders, most of them Spanish as their first language, and I don't speak Spanish, 32 second graders. I was armed with plenty of energy and the grit to succeed. I had even read a book in undergraduate. It was all about classroom management, and it was called Don't Smile Until Christmas. It's true. It's a true book. A couple weeks into the school year, there was a student named Douglas, and he was ruining my perfect plans. His unpredictable behavior upset the order that I was working so hard to establish. He was impulsive, blurting out whatever thought ran through his head whenever he wanted. Now, even though I had the backstory that could explain his behavior, it was difficult to have Douglas in the room. You see, Douglas's mother had abused heroin when she was pregnant with him, and the result of that abuse had caused significant behavioral and learning complications, but the extent of which were still coming to light in his eight-year-old body. His abilities and needs were a mystery. But combined with the work of caring for 31 other children, my patience with Douglas was growing thin. So one long afternoon, my patience was gone. I angrily ordered Douglas to leave the room and go to the hall. You see, it was a power move that I had seen my teachers do over the years. I wanted to make sure Douglas knew who was in charge in my classroom. I was prepared to let him have it. Demanding better behavior was the key to my professional success. Befriending him was not my plan. So out in the hallway, to my inexperienced teacher surprise, Douglas stood silently in front of me, silent. He didn't argue, protest, or defend his behavior. Instead, water filled his eyes to overflowing and tears began cascading down his chubby cheeks. The wild man of the classroom puddled before me into a sobbing, helpless child. He needed me. He needed a teacher that would look past everything about him that was a no and to see and to help him see that he was a yes. And in the dim light of that drafty hallway, I saw Douglas as if for the first time. Not as a project, not as a problem, but because he was entrusted to my care and he was entrusted to mine. 
It was in that moment I realized I loved him. And that love changed me from the inside out. Unsure of what that love would require of me and ask of him, by the end of that would-be confrontation, the truth was revealed to me. Love would take the lead. It was a love that did not come with easy answers, but it was patient and kind, and it did not insist on its own way. I believe that the fishermen dropping their nets and following Jesus were following love. That's the only way that I can imagine them giving up their livelihood, their reputations, everything they knew, trading it all in in an instant when an itinerant preacher shows up beside the sea and invited them to follow. Scripture doesn't give us many details about their response, except that it was quick and it was decisive. They dropped their nets. And James and John not only dropped their nets, they left their father. There's no way that those fishermen at this point in Jesus' ministry, there's no way that they were certain of where they were going, where that love would lead them, what would be required of them, yet they took those first steps. We hear stories right from our perspective looking back. We now know the stories that came later. We know now that when they followed Jesus that day, they brought their doubts with them and their questions, and their fear. I believe that outside that second grade classroom many years ago, the word of God showed up unannounced in the face of a vulnerable and crying eight-year-old boy. Jesus whispered to me to follow, summoned me to drop my pretense of following my own puffed-up authority and instead, let the author of life, the author of love, be my authority. Submitting to love, letting love lead, is not an easy task. The disciples had both a magnificent and a difficult road as they accompanied Jesus. But my guess is that they didn't regret their decision. I love the psalmist's prayer in Psalm 27. The psalmist is expressing a longing to dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze on the beauty of the Lord. I think a way to do that is to pay attention to love and where love bids you to follow. To gaze on the beauty of the Lord is to see with God's eyes what and who is beautiful and follow close behind. Let God's gaze be the direction you look, the direction you move. And so I ask you, what love has authored your life? And maybe there's been some false loves that have pulled you from the path of following perfect love. But perfect love knit your inward parts and knows you better than you know yourself. That's the love that beckons you to follow. And I think of this for us, for the church in this place. What collectively do we love? What do we love here at Supply? What or who catches our attention, breaks our hearts wide open, and so enlivens us to respond? The answer to those questions, that's our work. That's our envisioning work that we do together. And the answer to those questions is our ministry here at Supply. We can repeat what we've always done because it was good in that time and in that place. It may or may not be faithful to the call on our hearts today. 
Like those fishermen beside the sea, we can move our feet even if we still carry our doubt and our fear and our questions. Because following Jesus can feel like walking straight into what is uncomfortable, unpredictable, and uncertain. I think, it's, I think we can all admit that it's easier to hold fast to our nets, to what we know, because you want to stick with what is safe and sure, but it can also be small. So let today's scripture inspire us individually and collectively as a community of faith to let go of what is safe and secure and let love lead. Now, following where love leads, it's never a guarantee that you're, that you're certain that everything is going to work out. But remember, we're not called to be successful. We are called to be faithful. So years after that encounter with Douglas, it was about 25 or 30 years later, I was wrestling with a claim on my life another time to respond to a love that caught my attention. And that was my love for the Lord that I discovered in my teaching and in my volunteering at my church. And I was wrestling with a claim on my life to enter ministry. And I remember talking to my pastor at the time and thinking, something's up. Like, this is like, God doesn't call people like me. I don't sit in the big chairs. Um, Could this really be a call? Because it's not like there's a thunderclap or a voice. It wasn't one of those. It was a It was a claim on my life that wouldn't go away. Could it really be, I said, that a first grade teacher is supposed to resign and attend seminary? And I'll never forget what he said to me. He said, that's how you know it's holy. That's how you know it's holy. It's not certain. It wasn't sure. I had my doubts. I had my fear. I had my questions. Friends, it's not our call, it's Jesus calling. All praise to our Lord Jesus Christ who calls us to follow. Amen.
here. I'll take this off. Jason can go first. On behalf of the session, I present Melissa Einhorn, who has been received into the membership of this congregation by reaffirmation of faith. You come to us as a member of the one holy Catholic Church into which you were baptized and by which you have been nurtured. We are one with each other, sisters and brothers in the family of God. Rejoice in the gifts that you bring to us. Um, I can speak from, uh, I, I've heard about her yoga, but I also most of all know her personality and her warmth um, that she's already expressed on the time that she's been with us. Um, as you join with us in the worship and service of this congregation, it is fitting that together we reaffirm the covenant into which we were baptized, claiming again the promises of God, which are ours in baptism. Hear these words from Holy Scripture. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to the one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of us all, who is above all and through all and in all. Melissa, trusting in the gracious mercy of God, do you turn from the ways of sin and renounce evil and its power in the world? If so, say I do. Will you be Christ's faithful disciple, obeying his word and showing his love? If so, say, I will with God's help. I will with God's help. And with the whole church, let us confess our faith together using the Apostles' Creed, which is found in your bulletin. Give them a second to find it. And it's also on the screen. I believe in God. Excuse me, let us stand. Let us stand. There's no way you can remain seated and say these words. Again, I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. The quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. So, Melissa, you have publicly professed your faith. Will you be a faithful member of this congregation, share in its worship and ministry through your prayers and gifts, your study and service, and so fulfill your calling to be a disciple of Jesus Christ? If so, say, I will with God's help. I will. And now, friends, let us pray. Holy God, we praise you for calling us to be a servant people and for gathering us into the body of Christ. We thank you for choosing to add to our number our sister in faith. Guard your servant Melissa with your protecting hand. Lead her to know and obey your word that she may serve you in this life and dwell with you forever in the life to come through Jesus Christ our Lord, and all God's people say, Amen. And the elder says, welcome down here. Welcome to this congregation and its worship and ministry. Yay. <laughs> and now we have, you can pour. We're going to baptize Melissa and Brendan's daughter, Matilda. And the children are coming back for a front row seat.
Now, Clark and Hayden, you get to come up real close with your mom and dad and the godmother. Yes, you can come up. See the water? Hi. You can put your hand in. Yeah. Yeah. Sure, great. Okay. You're welcome to come over here on this side, too, if you want. So years from now, I think it'll be interesting when um, Matilda is told to remember her baptism. I don't think she'll have much of a memory. But I'm thinking that if you're the big brother and you're the big sister, maybe there's something about today that you'll remember about Matilda's baptism, and you'll tell them. Yeah, there's the water in there. Yeah. All right. Um, Jason, I need you, my love. We're going to share this, and you hold this for me, and you're going to go right there. On behalf of Session, I present Matilda Ann Einhorn to receive the sacrament of baptism. Friends, in presenting your child for baptism, you announce your faith in Jesus and show that you want your child to study the faith that we profess and serve Christ as his chosen disciple. Please show your purpose by answering the following questions. Do you trust Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? If so, say, I do. Relying on God's grace, do you promise to live the Christian faith and teach that faith to your child? If so, say, I do. Do you intend your, intend your child to be his disciple, to obey his word and show his love? If so, say, I do. And sponsors of this baby girl, do you promise through prayer and example to support and to encourage her to be a faithful disciple? If so, say, I do. Thank you. Now, Jason. Will the congregation please stand? Jesus Christ taught us to nurture those who are baptized. Do you, members of the Church of Jesus Christ, promise to tell Patricia the good news of the gospel? Nope. Matilda. Matilda. The good news of the gospel <laughs> to help her know all that Christ commands and by your community to strengthen their family ties with the household of God. If so, say we do. If you can hold this for me to go. So Matilda Ann, you are... A child of God. Oh, good, who's eating a pretzel. <laughs> you are a child of God, and you are God's beloved. Matilda. Look, look. I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son. And of the Holy Spirit. <gasps> oh. Oh. Let her see. You get some too. See, look at Clark. Is it too? And Hayden. Yeah. Look, it's okay. Yeah, now she's eating the pretzel again. Yes. And we'll turn the page. Okay. Matilda is now received into the Holy Catholic Church through baptism. God has made her a member of the household of faith to share with us in the ministry of Jesus Christ. I charge you, the people of this congregation, to nurture and love her and to assist her in becoming a faithful disciple. This is a joyous day as Matilda has been welcomed by you and marked as Christ's own forever. Please join me in welcoming Supply's newest member, Matilda Ann Einhorn, with the prayer printed in your bulletin. And on the screen. For you, little, little one, one, the Spirit of God moved over the waters at creation.
until it becomes your own. And so the promise of the gospel is fulfilled. We love because God first loved us. And let us continue in prayer using the words that Jesus taught us. Today you can pray with your eyes wide open if you'd like so that you can see this darling newest member of Supli Presbyterian Church. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation. Deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And the final song, there's a sweet, sweet spirit. And now go out into the world in peace. Be of good courage. Hold fast to all that is good. And return no one evil for evil. Support the weak. Strengthen the faint-hearted. Help the suffering. And honor all persons. No exceptions. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the sweet, sweet communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.